Hussain has been a long-term friend of the department as well as a very eminent uh, and distinguished alumni of uh, the physics department of the Erskine Presidency College. Uh, he has even collaborated with some of the uh, students of the uh, physics department since it became a university. Uh, Professor Shen's, uh, so after his BSc from the Australian Presidency College, Professor Shen did his PhD from University of Georgia and uh, postdoc stints at Michigan and Minnesota, and then he became a faculty member at SUNY Buffalo. His uh, research is on uh, nonlinear uh, complex systems, including granular material, and I, some of you may remember his fascinating talk on detecting underground uh, landmines using uh, using techniques that depend on this kind of calculations. Uh, lately, he has also uh, uh, sort of uh, grown an interest in applying his knowledge and uh, skills to approach complex systems uh, to overall sustainability and development. Uh, because uh, which can what can be more complex than sustainability of development? So, uh, so he has been a uh, member. He has been a Jefferson Science Fellow in USAID, where he has worked on similar things, and he is still involved in uh, various projects that are related to uh, development uh, and sustainability. And uh, today he will talk. He will share some of his experience uh, related to to that kind of work. And since this is a physics professor of physics uh, audience, so he will mix some uh, complex, <laughs> complex, <laughs> no physics anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but you know, I mean, this is a uh, nonlinear physics perspective of complex systems. Okay, so without further. Uh, I So if you want to know all the uh, all the things that cannot be said in the yeah. <laughs> you can ask. Bob G said. <laughs> okay, Professor Shea, thank you so much. Uh, I also have a very interesting thing from the ancient past. Ooh, which is this? <laughs> I was I was warned by my wife that you might get stopped in the uh, security. <laughs> Luckily, I haven't been. So thank you so much. Very very nice. So uh, this is very informal. As I said, there is no physics. Uh, but there is a lot of other things that we don't normally encounter in the um, How to empower the 3 billion kids? Kids, it was a very slangy version of saying young people uh, of the developing world. And the developing world actually is a very large world. Uh, in fact, the biggest part of the world, as we know, is the developing world. And I'm going to obviously focus on India because this is the only country I know reasonably uh, well other than the US. Um, and it's probably the best place in the world uh, to study development because India is a very, very interesting laboratory in its own right. And I talk about it. A little bit about this many affiliations, I want to say this is, this is my home. Buffalo. I've been attached to this NGO in um, uh, North 24 Organized now for more than 24, 25 years. And I work with them on a regular basis. I recently spent a long sabbatical at I did Jodhpur and did some of the work that I've mentioned. I started something. 
And I spent a year as a, a fellow at the uh, USA Institute of National Aid. That was in the COVID year 2020 2021. So, therefore, what I'm going to talk about is actually sort of a uh, sort of includes my research exposure experience, in my advising, my studies at all these places. So, I thought it would be pertinent to point out and give credit where credit is due because these are my colleagues and friends who have uh, been my. Uh, partners along the way. So I'll start with a with a very important thing for, for this presentation, which is uh, this particular um, quote by somebody I got to meet about seven, eight years ago in a, in a session I organized the APS meeting uh, in Los Angeles. This name, uh, this name is uh, that of Dan Siegel, who is a pediatric psychiatrist. Uh, Dan is a very brilliant man, and Dan is a very exciting author. Uh, and uh, he has a number of New York Times bestsellers books, actually. You can easily Google up. So, uh, and one of the things that Dan has uh, been very vocal about is in pointing out that uh, we don't, we really shouldn't be teaching the way we do. We, 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 the, the way we teach, the way we educate children, the way we communicate with children uh, is actually damaging and that has been a major theme of this work which is why uh, I, I, I wanted to start with uh, what he had to uh, say there is another theme i want to throw in and that is sdg so these are the united nations sustainable development goals which are everybody talks about them now and bop is bottom of the pyramid which means ground level issues right so there is a massive massive disconnect between the uh, SDG level considerations of what we think about, uh, how the world ought to be as we go down the road, uh, such that the plant survives and we, we don't all die in another 50 years, uh, to the uh, quote unquote bottom of the pyramid issues where change has to be made and what kind of connections have to be made. So I'm going to start to pull all these blocks together slowly, uh, hopefully in a way that makes sense. Now, Depending upon your consideration of beauty, the planet is, this planet is an extremely beautiful planet. Um, I, you don't have to hear it from me. You can just look at a picture, for example, and this is from the Bombay Natural History Museum. They, they, these guys do phenomenal work. So when I was in Jodhpur uh, trying to uh, study a little bit about the desert ecosystems, which is why I really went to Jodhpur last year, and I spent about half a year uh, these were the people who came to me and said, we want to be there with you because we have stuff to share and uh, we just want to learn along, along the way. Uh, if you look at the species of animals around, around India and around the world, the amount of work they have done on that is phenomenal. And this is just one of the nice motifs that they had created to capture some of the most common animals of nature with, with their colors, a little bit more colorized. So all of this should be contrasted with the fact that we are in the middle of the sixth major mass extinction event of the planet, and we'll be losing about a million, million species by the time a uh, few, few more years, maybe another 100 years rolls around. So we are in very, 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 very dangerous territory. And the news that we hear, the sort of um, themes that we listen to, they, they seem almost meaninglessly politicized and meaninglessly exaggerated and meaninglessly twisted. Uh, the, the real way of saying that is that there is a very strong chance that by the time your grandkids roll around, this planet may not re really be able to support much life. That's the reality. Although you don't hear it, because that's not politically correct to say, uh, any politician, if he or she pushes that point of view, uh, it won't last very long. So nobody wants that because this is what, you, and this is actually true, right? So if you look at it, if you were investing in a stock market, a stock that goes up like this would seem very good. Except in this case, this is the rise in sea levels. All right, so that's the contrast of. This is a picture of the planet, uh, relatively red being hot. You hear about forest fires. You hear about. Suicide bombers and terrorist attacks, of course, becomes from humans out their part of systems. 
So you can see this hull being washed away. You can see oil being taken out. You can see, you know, solid waste being burned, enormous amounts of noxious gases coming out of it. Uh, homes being consumed by forest fires across the across the world. Um, as I left US, this was on the news. This is a heat dome sitting on the northeast of US, and we had temperatures nearing 95 degrees, which is incredibly hot for Buffalo, but not to mention it, it being high latitude, you won't be able to work in the garden at the temperature because the sun is so damn piercing that you almost feel like you are being actually poked by a needle. And in Buffalo, it was 95 degrees. Yeah. Wow. It probably will reach 100 degrees. Wow. Around this time. Yeah, and this guy we all know. Right? Coronavirus. So this, every 10 years we get a pandemic, which has been happening forever now. And, and it's just that, you know, this time uh, we lost a lot of people. Uh, but in terms of the, historically, the number of people that have died of pandemics, the numbers in this COVID actually were pretty much at the lower middle of the pack. I mean, we have lost 200, 300 million people too. Uh, if you were to educate your child, right, uh, especially a child who may not be uh, privileged or may be privileged, then it has been pretty much established in the, in the psychology community and from the people, from you know, from the education community and so on, that the way you empower a child uh, is to make sure that you keep this perspective in mind. So as a child, you can be very creative, you can be very sort of, uh, you can throw a fit if you don't like something, uh, or you can be super excited. <laughs> you can still throw a fit anyways, but you can be super excited, you know. Uh, and so your emotions uh, you know, can, can, can run over a wider parameter range, and, and your intellectual uh, behavior and observations can also be pretty freewheeling, right? But when we're an adult, we pretty much have a style, and we pretty much uh, are very risk averse. Uh, but, but but when we are in the youth, uh, for for the kid, uh, then then uh, you are in this tricky uh, bridge to cross. Uh, you, you tend to be innovative and curious and all that. You have all these skills that are highly developed as an adult, uh, with still the elements of childhood in there. But your emotional skills tend to be still weak. So therefore, it's a relatively dangerous phase because you may not be able to handle yourself well. So that's why it's called uh, a tricky bridge to cross, which in effect is captured through this uh, through these two words, uh, liminal space, which essentially captures the same thing. And and the point is that uh, so 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 it is kind of thought that uh, uh, connection connection meaning feeling of safety, feeling of having a structure. To, to society around you, uh, you know, being connected to people and so on, that's important, connection. Confidence, we all know, character, we all know. Character basically means, the, the best way of saying what character is, is that the primary job is to care for others and not care for yourself. Uh, caring and character about the same, contribution, so you, you should be uh, concerned about what you are doing with your life, and not spending too much time in talking about it. Uh, and, and then and then and then confidence, which is that you should. So anyway, so so these six C's are, are taken to be kind of a signature of a well-rounded individual, and this particular uh, sort of scheme is known as positive youth development. So when USAID goes out and does work, let's say the jungles of Honduras or Guatemala or, or parts of India or, or Ethiopia or what have you. And they work with children and work with young people, then they kind of keep the scheme in mind and they kind of work, work the scheme uh, with due sort of modifications and considerations to whatever local conditions, local customs, local culture, um, you know, that can be integrated into it. So, uh, hmm. please, please. Yeah, yeah. Please, please. so I mean, uh, I think this is very interesting, but. Is it okay to think? I mean, for example, an adult is expected to have most of these, uh, you know, attributes sort of in balance. Whereas, they're more they can they are supposed to control. It's not true that all adults do that, but they are supposed to be able to control their wild emotions better. 
But as a child, is you know, as you said, huh. so why? I mean, what makes the youth thing very exciting? Is it because that they still have uh, much more creativity than to expect uh, to have uh, during adulthood? That's why they. Yes. So yes. the creativity level is still. I mean, that's an expectation. I mean, uh, it turns out, of course, that adults can remain very creative. Even yes. In their late nineties and more. But the, the broader understanding is that, that, that youth uh, is a very special state when you tend to have uh, a good deal of ability to for, 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 yeah, for explore, to control certain things. Yeah, yeah. You don't control really. things, which as an adult you might, but you, you also have bigger skills in yes, terms of how you manage it. Right? Oh, I wanted to make another point. Uh, if, if you look at the behavior of humanity, Right. Behavior of humans, you know, humans on the planet. Uh, we certainly are, are not a child, but we certainly are not an adult, either, right? So we, so in a way, the humanity itself is stuck in this limited space, right? which is the reason why we probably won't last very long. So it's up to the next generation and the next generation to be the real stewards. So just to make you feel worse, uh, I want to point out something that I just found in 2024. So these are the imaginations, uh, sustainable development goals that all the governments uh, are trying to pay attention to in, in a very trivial way. So one is you no know, poverty, this is zero hunger, and so on and so forth. And, and they are numbered, right? So just like we like to number things, uh, these are numbered. So G1 is goal one, there is no poverty. And if there's a green line here, that means in this particular area, uh, let's say, the overall progress is 17% from zero. So zero to 17% plus. Okay. So if it's like 18%, 19%, uh, like that. Okay. And on this side, uh, it is 17% on the negative side, going the other way. So without saying much uh, more than what I need to say, 50% is right around here. Uh, you can see that we are actually more on the regression side than on the progress. So more red than green. Yeah. And essentially what it is, is that this is from 2024 web page of the very guy that put this up. So this is the UN web page. And so I didn't do anything like this. It's progress in how many years? So far. So, uh, people how people after the Paris support. So Paris support pretty much set, set this agenda in, in in play, right? When was that? I think it was, it was like about maybe 13, 14 years yeah. ago. I think 2014, 2013 was the time. Period. So let's say around about a decade, right? So we are actually, it doesn't matter the point is we are going back. We, we, were not, we have not been going forward in anything for a while. Um, and I'll tell you one simple, one simple reason for it before I move on to the education issue, which I want to uh, talk a little bit about. And that is because our education, in part, is 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 westernized. I would claim, which I didn't put here, and that westernized education somehow pushes this mantra, if you will, of reductionist thinking. Right? We we take a problem, then we piece it down to one important part of the problem, and then piece another part of it to another important piece of the problem. Then we solve the the first reduced problem. Then look at the second reduced problem, completely orthogonalized in the first problem, and so on and so forth. Uh, turns out that that uh, is probably a problem in its own right, because that doesn't solve uh, much, because the, because the upshot of solutions from individual boxes are not integrated up in the way it should be, and the, and the ultimate integration can yield a very different result than what we're inferring it to be. So reduction is thinking, therefore, probably problematic in its own right, uh, a much more meaningful way would be a, what one, one could say, let, let's say complex systems thinking or whole systems thinking, where the point is that all these parameters are tangled up. Okay? Let's, you can't really orthogonalize them. You can't say this is an independent variable, that's an You can't really do that because there's no such thing as it is. I mean, your life is not made up of independent variables, right? I mean, you know very well that in the morning, if you don't eat breakfast, it's not just a matter of skipping breakfast. Yes. It's a matter of probably getting acidity. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of probably you'll be too hungry for lunch, you might overeat. Then you might fall asleep instead of being attentive. I mean, it's a chain reaction that happens. 
at the at the end of the day after a month you might actually be ill or who knows in your case it might be healthy so <laughs> this is the hallmark of a complex system and this is the kind of stuff that needs to go in because the world is that complicated and and we shouldn't be oversimplifying it rather we should be looking at it in its, in its full in its full form and this kind of led me to the issue of how the study of interconnected systems can be better done in local context. Take a local system, study the local system very well, solve the local system's problems the best you can, and perhaps that will begin to give you some clues on how these complex systems actually might be working for a given environment. Right? So this is very foreign to me because I'm trained like you guys. Uh, as a physicist, I like to break things down into orthogonal variables and solve the problems and then integrate it back up, works in physics, it doesn't work in life. Which is one reason why I think that we have this problem with sustainability and so on. Let me skip the Raman slide. I, I, I put it in long time ago in the context of teaching science and teaching to think because C.V. Raman had some interesting characteristics in him. And um, he really believed in asking the quote unquote right question. And we have kind of drifted away from the whole philosophy of asking the right question. We like to ask the simplest question. That's politics, I think. Probably. <laughs> but the simplest question is not necessarily the right question. And I think I think that there is a lesson there. So I'm only going to point it out. Uh, let me skip that. I, I don't think this is the talk. This part of the talk, I think I hadn't modified up. So let me see if I can skip ahead a little bit because I had a few other slides in the other talk which I wanted to show because they are very interesting. Anyway, let's go on with it. I, I'm not going to change it too much. Um, the, this particular piece of the piece of the talk is, is the importance of curiosity and the importance of, of, ch of childhood and how uh, that plays a role into how we might want to think about being partners with the kids, quote unquote. By the way, I define kids in a specific way to quote that three billion figure. So let me just tell you that story. Uh, the way kids are defined is that there's a child, which is typically up to age 10, and then or 10 to 12. And then there is a young uh, phase, and then there is a more senior youth phase and so on. But if you look at a more uh, sort of, uh, look at a less nuanced picture, you find that the youth pretty much lasts from 25 to early 30s to mid 30s. That's the youth phase. Okay. So it's much longer and much more stretched out. For some people, uh, youth may cross over to being an adult in early 20s. For some people, it may be much longer. So it's sort of like from the uh, late adolescent to young adult phase in some 16 to 30 or 15. That is a tradition of thinking. But uh, as I studied more and more, it became pretty clear that it was much bigger than uh, yeah. So anyway, so the, this curiosity is very important in, in the youth phase. And there is a lot of research that's, that's you know, kind of uh, piling up now that, that is beginning to show that uh, curiosity is very healthy. Curiosity is very healthy. And, and in fact, curiosity uh, needs to be really, really encouraged. There have been some of these studies, but one was from Berkeley. I think this was this, 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 this woman who was a PhD student at UC Berkeley. So this is one of her papers. She's a professor somewhere now. And this is another paper. So it's been progressively seen as very important. So I'm throwing lots of bits and pieces. I don't know how many of you know of yeah. Arvind's work. Arvind Gupta is very important. Uh, the figure who is an engineer who basically um, crashed <laughs> toys. That was Arvind's link. And uh, but these experiments actually are surprisingly complicated, which is something that often people I, I feel tend to not talk about enough. Uh, this is how kids are. Look at look at this girl. I mean, how can you not be excited with this girl, right? And look at what she's doing. Uh, the story basically says that this girl is very excited to see this, essentially, the, you know, this kind of uh, boxes. She's fascinated by boxes. So she saw it, this is her dad, and she basically decided to sit in one and express herself, and this is the dad also joining in, right? Uh, this is my, my daughter, actually. Yeah. Uh, when she was two, and this is one of my papers, and she ate the first page. 
Um, <laughs> she is now a hotshot nuclear chemist, though she's never born. Um, but in this case, she was teething. And she figured that you know chewing on the paper would probably reduce her, 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 her gum pain. And she was very serious in chewing on it. And I, and I realized when the first page was gone, <laughs> I don't know why I had to dig it out of her tongue. Uh, curiosity has played an important role. This person is the, one of the founders of the city of Princeton in Princeton. Uh, he was a medical doctor. His name was Abraham Stetson. And the reason why I put him up is because he, he said of it, he, he used this very important phrase in one of the books he wrote uh, about the usefulness of uh, useless knowledge. So, so we generate a lot of useless knowledge, and we truly tend to believe that it's useless, but knowledge is not useless knowledge. So there are two aspects to knowledge. One is knowledge that is directly relevant to living a life, mm -hmm. where we really screw up. And then, there, <laughs> and, then, and then there is this knowledge aspect, which has to do with being curious, with, the, with our natural desire to discover and learn and pray. And oftentimes we turn on blinders in these when we become uh, attached to a discipline. So when I went to IIT Jodhpur, which is, as you know, in the middle of the Thar desert, um, I went there to study the desert. For the first time, I felt really uncomfortable that here I am, who, who, feel, who feels most comfortable in front of a pen and paper, uh, trying to do something and then look up something on Google to see if I'm... Instead, I was looking at... Uh, you know, trees, I was looking at dirt, I was looking at little bugs crawling around the place, I was looking at all kinds of animals. Once I got attacked by like a million black ants and I couldn't figure out what happened. So, bizarre experiences, right? But what was fascinating was after a while, in as uncomfortable as I was, I realized that it was, it was me who was the problem, it was not they who were the problem. They were doing what they should be doing instinctively. My instincts have been turned down to a big, in a big way, right? So we made a, so we made a study which we haven't published because it's still going on, still in its early stages, of how the various animals and the and the and the bugs and the birds and this and that and the and the plants were mutually connected, and we found this incredibly tangled web uh, with enormous amount of. Uh, uh, sort of redundant connections. And one reason why the world seems okay is because we are still surviving in some of these late hanging redundant connections. There will be a collapse. And we probably are not too far from this collapse where the entire ecosystem will collapse and the sea, sea would die off. And these, these collapses don't happen gradually. They're first order phase transition. They just go. So, uh, but all of this, uh, this is Cian Yang. He said he said something about the uh, issue of developing a taste of non, uh, of what you like to do because we each are special. We each bring our creativity, and we are able to see things in a way that is different from other things. How gold would see something, I won't be able to see it, and vice versa. Although we may be looking at the same equations, right? He may look at it much more seriously than I would. Or the other way around. <laughs> so, so, the, so it is. It is very unique to our perspectives, and that is a very good thing because we bring in not only the fact that we are trained as a scientist or we know yeah more math. We also bring in the fact that I don't like looking at an alpha symbol somewhere maybe, or the fact that this equation doesn't seem nice enough. I mean, I had a, I had a big discussion with a very famous physicist who played a big role in my life much later, Sidney Nagel from the University of Chicago. And uh, Sid had given a talk on, on how avalanches happen on slopes. He had done some beautiful experimental work. This was 1993. And uh, he explained the whole onset of avalanches by relying on friction. And uh, the way I was trained, I, I, I did not like friction because to me, friction is essentially, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a problematic thing to define. Because it's first of all a dissipative system. Dissipation is hard to measure. If you want to look at friction, friction has to be approached in terms of stuff like autocorrelation functions, memory functions, and so on. So I asked him these questions, and he was not very happy. And then we had a bit of a, a bit of a set of disagreements. 
And then after a long time, Sid said, well, although I've been fighting with you, but I, Michael Fisher asked me pretty much the same questions last week when I gave a talk of merit. So I felt very good about it. But <laughs> see, this is a matter of taste. I mean, to him, friction is natural. To me, friction is disturbing. Um, now I just want to tell you a little bit more about how we, how how interesting things are. So we need. I'm going to the point. You're probably thinking, why am I telling you so many different things? I'm, I'm going towards the issue that we need roots to save ourselves. This this is the message that I need to bring in, and we can't be treating you the way we have been treating you ever since uh, modern education, which is a bad word to me. Uh, and see, right? So several important people have, have been emphasizing this. The other one is this name you guys know probably quite well, Jim Helfman, an astronomer uh, from uh, Colombia. So Pascal, Pascal invented the calculator at age 19 and 16 point. Let's just, just, just soak that up, right? It has changed our ability. So you don't need a Shakuntala Devi to calculate. Uh, you can do it yourself. Right? Transform it. Uh, Louis Braille, basically it is his work in 1835. He was a 16-year-old kid. Now our 16-year-olds are supposed to be taking exams. Yes. They are dead, right? I mean. And coaching centers. And coaching. Yeah, but in our time, coaching, and right now, coaching center, yeah. So, uh, modern electronic TV goes back to a 15 year old who first did it. Philo Hansford. If you are a surfer, uh, the first surfboard, sailboard, was designed and built by the side with his dad, Peter Chilvers, uh, 1958. In fact, when I was coming on the plane, there was a young fellow next to me. He works for a uh, surfing company. He was coming to coming to Madras to check out whether Madras of Madras can be a good area for surfing uh, for people who are learners. Right? They don't want big waves, but some waves. And I told him that there was a kid who first who designed the first surf. He had no idea. He said, "I didn't know that." Uh, and then there are all these young people. Somebody designed a smart cane, which is uh, for blind people. So essentially, it's. And the cane has a sensor built into it. The cane can sense if there's, if there's an obstruction. So it gives a prior warning by essentially uh, putting in a vib vibration signal. Uh, face recognition software locking and unlocking mechanism was designed by a young Indian kid named Zeshmi. Um, first open source portable braille printer. I think it took, took it out. So. And then this, uh, this girl. So, so Shittal Guadalupe Cruz Lopez, solar powered water heater using recycled objects, plastic material, age eight. Uh, you know, it's it's astounding. Uh, this one very interesting. I'm sure you got some help probably from an adult, but that, that's okay. The, the, it's not a competition really. Use a ferrofluid, uh, ferrofluid particles in water uh, to attract microplastics, and then use the magnetic forces to remove the microplastics. This is pretty good stuff. I mean, if, if we don't even have to scale it up, we can just use it locally, right? Uh, but that alone is transformative. Then this girl, Erin Smith, uh, if, and this is just the ones we know. So imagine what we don't. I mean, this is like not even 0.00001%. Erin Smith uh, is an AI tool that analyzes video footage for signs of Parkinson's age 16. And these are you know, regular discoveries that are patented and gone through the usual hoops and all that. Let's now focus on India because India is a very interesting country. Uh, I mean, you guys probably know this. Uh, let me let me ask you a question. Uh, how many languages does India have? 18 official. Mm -hmm. so, total. total. Active language. Like, okay, India. 100 plus of Anything else going in the market? Yes, it's only hundred something. The other guesses. You're guessing you'll be wrong. 
Five times the number of states. So then you are talking about hundred and hundred. Maybe two hundred ish. Yeah, I think about 200. All of you are wrong. All of you are wrong. <laughs> the number of dialects is about 20,000. Bengal alone, I, I'm sure, has at least of the order of a few thousand. Dialects. Fine. I mean, you go from uh, a place like Bodhishal to a place like, you know, Medinipur, and nobody understands each other. Mm -hmm. Um, so, all these numbers are uh, more or less common, but the number that is not common to the world, to Indians it is, but not common to the world, is that Indian, India is 66% good. I was having a fun conversation with the guy who said he was alive, a kid, when India was 80% good, I think he was lying. Uh, he's my age, but I remember India being 70% older. Okay. Oh, is that about right? Uh, so I think it has gone from 70 to about, about 66, and I'm going to be 64 in November. So it tells you this moving very slowly. Today. So the 66% rural uh, whittles down to about 700 million young. So if there's any problem in the universe, we can solve it. Pure number game. We just need to not let education muck it up. That's it. Um, here you can see me. Um, In the blue shirt. Uh, and this is actually a juvenile detention facility. And this is in Sotra. So these girls actually are abandoned children. Um, this, is a, this lady is a helper. And uh, this guy is also a teacher, a teacher. Uh, here's my uh, NGO partner. He was a big role play in this. Um, so he runs the NGO. All these kids are abandoned kids by their parents. They're, they're in the age group of about six to about 15, 16 age. And this, I think this girl was one of the six year olds uh, and so on. So they're, they have a very sad past. Abandoned as they were, uh, they are typically taken to uh, Brussels. Who takes them to Brussels? Yes. Pops. Yes, Their relatives mostly are neighbors. Pops, Pops, Pops too. Pops. You find them there. They go to the pins. At least in these areas, rural areas. This is where is this? This is mostly. Not where this, this is in Salt Lake. In Salt Lake, the camp is Salt Lake, but this. Kids are from all over Bengal. All over, all over. That's a local region. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm talking, actually, I'm having a very interesting conversation with the girl who's here. I might need to show a picture of that. That girl asked me a question. So, so Nilanshu, this is Nilanshu. Nilanshu was encouraging the girls to talk to me because, you know, I've, I've, I've gone into their, uh, their um, basically the facility. This is like a school that's inside the facility. So I've gone and talked to them. There's a library also. And then they get some usual thing. They're, they're not really imprisoned per se, but they, they're not allowed to get out of the campus in the building and so on. They have a very restricted lives. And this girl asked, he suddenly stood up and asked me, uh, why is there so much pollution here? You know, it's a, it's, I really don't like it. And then uh, I hear about climate change and warming and tell me a little bit more about it. How does the pollution relate to that? So she was smart enough to know that. She, she's not, she hardly has been to school. I don't know if I have further pictures of this child in this version. So the question is, what are we really doing? I mean, uh, can we, can we not, can we not treat individuals for what they are and not allow them to, you know, develop their, we don't have to do it. That's it. That is the answer. The answer is we don't have to do it. We just have to create a space. We just have to let them interact. We just have to let them be creative. We just have to let them have fun. We also need to let them 
learn to respect each other and not fight and be selfish. We can give them some common values and we can basically facilitate learning for them. We don't even need to be there. We can give them some books maybe, maybe a few computer terminals, depending upon what stage they are in, maybe a few movies, not too much. Maybe ask them a few questions, try to see if they can think about answers. There's no, nothing, nothing wrong with being wrong. Right? It's the whole examination disease that messes up because always we have to be right in a certain way. Now, um, and this may be part of the part of the way uh, to solve the problems uh, for this, you know, six or seven hundred uh, million young people in just about seven hundred thousand villages. And these villages are so distinct: different, different languages, different, different dialects, different, different lifestyles, geographical differences are enormous. What is Rajasthan like and what is Bengal like? Two particular states in which I have picked up some recent experience are just so dramatically, dramatically different that it, it's uh, it's crazy. I want to tell you a little bit more that not all of you may know about what rural Bengal is like and what happens in, in rural Bengal. Basically, there are three universes that live in rural Bengal. There is a wealthy rural Bengal with the business class. They earn about $3,000 a month, about a couple of lakhs a month. Uh, they're mostly business owner types, high affordability, they have good internet connection. They, have, they may not have a Mercedes, but they have nice, nice cars and amenities of life. They can afford anything. So their lives in rural Bengal or rural India is not very different than anywhere else in urban India. Not significant. Certainly not for the kids, right? Then there is uh, the second India, uh, upper middle class, reasonably wealthy. Uh, they don't make maybe so many lakhs, maybe a lakh, maybe thousands still, but still living in rural society, making enough money that they can send their children to private schools, they can have access to computers, uh, whatever. Trouble begins uh, from here on. So here on down, you are looking at lower middle class to the poor. Uh, the Indian poor is a very strange poor. It doesn't fall in the one of the standard buckets of the SDGs. Because the Indian poor is not extreme poor. Extreme poor is about two, two and a half dollars. This is more than that. Okay. So you're essentially looking at three to four dollars a day in American parlance incomes, which of course always has a local meaning. But in India, with 10 to 14,000 a month, you don't starve, you can have a reasonable life if you're living in a village. In fact, today I was talking to uh, a woman, she, she's, like, she's like an ayah, and she works uh, you know, for my parents. And basically the idea I got was if she takes about eight or 9,000 per month, uh, with her husband's income, there is enough money, so she can afford to skip a few days. So this is, uh, when you say poor, I mean, this is the part the income in terms of like international standard. Like the no, no, this is, this, is, this is actually the Indian poor in the rural area. Okay, so this is the... There is no real poverty. In it. So poverty is defined as internationally is two to three dollars. So I think four. one dollar is, yeah, maybe two dollars no, a day. Two, but there is no this real poverty there. This is the about eight dollars. Unless you go to certain specific communities in, in remote areas and so on, which we hear a lot about all, all, all on the time, all the time, real poverty in India is no longer really there in, in, a, in a broad sense. Okay. So, but these are the people who don't have a, an Android phone or may have one for a family of four. These are the people who are not going to school because the entire Bengal school system has collapsed. That's another story I'll come to hopefully a little bit. I don't know. Uh, lower middle class, of course, a little bit better off, but they still don't have access to private stuff that these do. So hence, this becomes a totally different universe. Children are not getting educated. People want to play with the Android phone if they have that maximum use of Android phone is in watching, watching for now. That's what Android phones are used for. I'm, I'm serious, but that's what it is. So this is this is the story of, of this thing. 
and the problems that are being solved are being solved on a small scale. And I have a, I have a, I have a problem with it myself. I'll tell you why. And this person, as you know, is extremely important. I mean, this is Muhammad Yunus. Muhammad Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize. And Muhammad Yunus's work has to do with how uh, the poor, uh, I already defined the poor, people with less money, less resources, less ability to uh, acquire important things, maybe a little bit more land, maybe, you know, farm equipment and so on and so forth to have a better living, uh, how they can pool in uh, these community resources to take a loan and, and buy something uh, without having to be reliant on the, on the government, without having to be reliant on, you know, some kind of donation from the rich people. While that is fantastic and certainly worthy of a Nobel Prize, the problem I have is as follows. You guys are physicists, so you can do the numbers. If you look at the number of super rich in a large country like India or the United States or Great Britain and so on, you'll find that a good 50-60% of the nation's wealth, if not more, is sitting out there. Okay. Now, if you look at the poor, they don't have much wealth. So economists tend to think of it as money coming down from that block down to the lower end. And much of the policy oftentimes is driven by discussions of that flavor and then blame the guy and whatever. I do, of course, personally feel that rich people should pay more taxes. I mean, that's only normal. Right? The tax are a percentage. It's not like you are losing all your money. So nobody is making that argument. <laughs> Which is often me. So, but simply put, India is very special because every villager in India has a home. There is, excepting, for example, you go to the remote Sundarban area where people don't have homes. Every villager in India has a home. This has been something that. Prime Minister Modi has seen through completion pretty much along the, across the board. That solves a big problem. In US, there are home, more homeless people than, than in India. That has solved a massive problem. And thanks to the enormous amount of effort by Congress government and the BJP government for doing this, because this has been a transformative change. This will power India 200 years ahead if we last that long. If you have a home, then you have a safe place. What else do you need? You need the freedom to study, you need the freedom to develop, you need the freedom to mature. You need teachers. You need interesting people to interact with. You need to be encouraged. You need to retain your curiosity, right? So for that, the nation needs to have an education system that is honest, that encourages them. No country has it. Education system has been a disaster and a collapse across the world. What about Finland and Singapore? By the way, so what about Argon poor? Do they have homes? Or... You are very smart. <laughs> <laughs> I had evaded the problem. Uh, I, I have evaded the topic of urban poor so far because it's a very important and serious problem. And urban poor problem has not been solved, addressed anywhere that I know of. Although I'm, I'm really uh, excited to see the, the, what would be the pluses and minuses of the Dharavi development. Because Dharavi development is supposed to be essentially move the people, it's not all the people, that's part of the problem. But those who actually have a home, not the renter and the renter, renter, not that second order, third order effects, and move them to some kind of apartments and so on and so forth. But this needs to be done carefully. So I'm, I'm sure they'll do a pretty decent job, but it's a it's an enormous experiment. This is not an Indian problem. I mean, I, I have worked quite closely with the brand. Who, who works on slums in Ghana. Ghana has a very big slum problem, and he works mostly in Accra. The, most of the problems are common. For example, electricity is very expensive, both in rural India and in the slums of India. 
because it is all third party stolen yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah, stolen stuff. Middlemen. Wherever middlemen get involved, the development is finished. So, so yeah, what I'm trying to say then is Muhammad Yunus did some fantastic work, but Muhammad Yunus' solution is, is not going to make people big. So if you are looking at 67% of the Indian farmers that are really getting peanuts for their hard work because they have a little bit of land, they are not able to take care of the land, they're not able to get the best out of the land because they don't have the machinery, they don't have the wherewithal. If you want to bring them up, you've got to give them a little bit more su such that their labor is going to be worth it because then their children can get a better education. If their children can get a better education, they can be employable. Kids have to be curious. Kids, kids have to be caring. Kids have to have a home. Kids have to be industrious. Humans are good enough. If you give them that, they'll take care of everything. They don't need your dough. They don't need rich people's money. In fact, rich people's money have done nothing to the world because the whole idea is rich people want how that money is to be spent. You can't tell poor people, you know, that you don't have money, I'm giving you money, don't eat, but you buy a car. That's roughly, I mean, I'm giving an extreme example, you make a point, but that's roughly what it boils down to. Yeah. You can eat, but you can't have potatoes. It's like that, you know. So, so this is a problem. I mean, this problem, nobody talks about it, but I hope somebody does. So there are no real easy solutions. I mean, you guys know this better than I do, but, you know, essentially almost everybody reaches the eighth grade because there is no education system. There are no exams. There's no testing. It's not going in. Student to teacher ratio is, is, is sometimes it's good, but mostly it's not very good. This, I mean, I, I look at the textbooks that are currently being used, and I can assure you that the textbooks are exactly the same, as bad as the textbooks we had. That was 50 plus years, 50 plus years ago. So uh, nobody comes to school. Well, if I were there, I can assure you I wouldn't have completed school. Okay. Yes. So being, right, I mean, just because I was yes. born with uh, at least a bronze spoon in my mouth, if it were a silver one, I, I survived and made it through. Lucky, right? This is this is being born on the right side of the tracks. That so, but you know, in in the end of 21st century, we are looking at kids who will survive well into the 22nd century. Why do we have to think in the gutter? Why can't we think a little better? And there are solutions, and there are so many solutions. India has 17 percent of the world's suicide rate. And we blame the fact that there is no counselor there. I don't know if anybody has studied how many counselors have saved how many people from suicide. I would like to see that number. Seriously. So we had a problem that I was dealing with. Uh, yeah, this is related to the population. Seventy percent is just the population. So the population of the world. So it's the same. Yeah. yeah. It's not a problem uh, in so India. It's definitely a problem. No, not, no, the numbers are 225,000 a year. Whatever, it's just a problem. No, no, but what he's saying is India's total population is about 20% of the world. Of the world, yeah. That's why we have so many people. I mean, no, but, 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 but you have to look at the raw numbers. You have to look at the raw number. I prefer to put in the raw number. Here I didn't have to So maybe the, yeah, the rate of uh, suicide is 1,000 people. Whatever. I don't know what is the rank of but, India, but definitely. So India's rank is about four of them. Yeah, it is particularly when you go to youth suicide. Yeah, yeah. I think India is very high. It is the youth only. The it problem is the youth only. The youth suicide is like very, very high. And India. a lot of them are women. Women and also very young kids and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, problem. Similar problems are there in, in Ghana also. The the but but many of these can be solved. And these are some other numbers. About 2.7 million people visit Bengal enrolled in grade one, 1.1 million passed out of grade 10. 0.64 million finished grade 10 in 2023. About 0.45 million, about half a million seats in the college of colleges of Bengal. Ultimately, uh rote learning, everybody wants to. Get a government job if they can, very few do. Curiosity breeds depression, makes it. I mean, we have just primed it for failure. 
it's optimized for trading. Which is really sad because you know there's so much talent, right? You, you let them be and see where they go. So humans are smart, can this help teach if they have access to learning materials? True or false? Actually, it is a very complicated story. I'm going to stop soon, but you know, I'm not even halfway to stop. But there is this whole concept that we often hear, this reductionist concept that you give them, put everything online, and the problem will somehow magically get solved. There is no evidence yet that that happens. There is evidence that people are extremely um, smart in how they want to pick up material and learn if they get interested, if they start asking questions. There's strong evidence for it, but we are very good at that. You don't even have to look at the literature, you can look at yourself and figure it out pretty much, right? So question now becomes that if you have everything up there and if you could give everybody a computer, what would happen? I can tell you that the, that the silicon pollution of the world will grow up dramatically. That is an assured result. It's also an assured result that computers will die after a certain span of time, which means that Apple and all these companies will make a lot of money providing billions of kids with the and you're talking trillion dollar money. Would they learn anything? I don't know. So there, there was this big push theory by uh, Steve Obama, he's still a professor at MIT, uh, about this idea of get, uh, get them Give them a computer and yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. his name is also here. So um the volume the one, yeah. But but evidence doesn't point to success yet at all. In fact, evidence points to the fact that giving a child a computer has thus far been a total failure. But this project was pushed by some very wealthy uh, folks from MIT, some donors uh, who wanted to look into this and the sheer numbers are that even if the computers cost hundred dollars which they don't um, you're talking about a number which is of the order of 70 uh, billion for india alone to do anything even reasonably meaningful in terms and this is just the first bloody computer so just for a few years cost doesn't work out this is never going to work i think we are not even taking into account the cost of infrastructure paying in person. In fact, all the, 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 recently there was a big experiment uh, in, in South America along these lines that also had big, big issues. Uh, I give the math here, but I'll skip it because we have, we have had a long conversation already. Uh, but schooling has not been like this kind of colonial schooling we have. Schooling has been very different. And uh, I, I survived. Uh, so a glimpse, a glimpse, I thought I'd go down for a while. A glimpse at the history of formal education system goes back to about 2600 BC in, in Egypt. Right? So I don't know the Indian numbers, but Indian numbers would be comparable. And it quickly revealed something that education has been and continues to be by the elite and for the elite. Education has never been for the masses. Now, how gratifying is that to hear? <laughs> I'm not kidding. I actually have done this work. Uh, of course, I can't throw out you know, many, many papers when I give a talk. Uh, education for the masses appears to have been historically focused on skill development. This is the answer to India's employment problem. This is the answer to America's employment problem. We have vocational training. Of course. Because that doesn't exclude one from having other, other learning, right? So we need to have a system where if you want to learn about astronomy and how the universe was formed or uh, how humans are the way they are about human consciousness or about the consciousness of some other animal, nothing stops you from doing it. The knowledge is available. All you have to do is go to a library. If you don't have a computer, sit in front of a terminal, start asking questions, start getting answers and figure it out yourself. So any person who has reached a certain pedestal can do that. And I would I would say that somebody who has gone to who has gone about fifth or sixth grade decent education can do some math and 
read and write and preferably in English because that's where everything happens to be, you are already primed for success in that department, right? You, you need some guidance. If you can reach out to somebody, you are all set. But that was very difficult even for me when I was growing. I had only one person who was an astronomer who was my neighbor and was very nice to give me time. And I tried to answer all my stupid questions. Um, and I thought, wow, that was so amazing. But this is the point. But you know, you asked me to fix a toilet, I can't do it. It took me a while to repair a car. I, I was repairing my clutch. It was a very interesting experiment for me. I screwed up, obviously, but the clutch did work, excepting that normal clutch works in about that range. My clutch worked in this range. <laughs> so the sensitivity of how I pressed my feet had to be about nine times more than what it should have <laughs> But hey, I mean, I remember it. I was 25 years old when I did that. I'm 64, and I... So uh, for, for this many years, I've remembered that. So I'm not going to screw it up. If you ask me to make a clutch again, repair the clutch again, I think I'll do a better job. At least maybe the third. So anyway, skill development is, 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 is probably something that we need. And the, the NGO I work with, I, I'm, I'm pushing them in that direction. This also includes you know, uh, maintaining farms, doing proper burning compost, uh, taking care of the soil, trying to understand the carbon cycles, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's not as simple as it sounds, but it's pretty, pretty simple. Uh, we are losing girls like crazy. We bleed girls in the, through the education system uh, in a, at an incredible rate, especially outside the urban environment. And, the, and there are many causes of it, but the cause that you don't hear often about is that the problem is bathrooms. It's not a major scientific problem. But if you are trying to make a bathroom, that is for young women who can have a can have a disability. Let me give you the answer quickly. There is no such toilet in the world. And this is the reason why I told you pattern on this year, we lose pretty much. 65 to 75 percent of women along the way who are not not in the urban center. Just imagine that loss. In India, we mean or in the world? So 60 to 70 percent of what? Uh, of the of number of kids who go to school. Go to school. Under, you mean this, 80 to 70 percent are disabled girls? No. Girls' toilets, the, the disabled, disabled is a significant amount. No, 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 no. Yeah, you, you just have to have your period to become a disabled girl. Yeah. You just have to have your period. If, if you don't have a proper toilet, you become a disabled girl. If you have one toilet for 200 girls, that in effect becomes the same problem. That is interesting. So, no matter which way you cut it. So, you know, And these are more pictures of classrooms and so on that we have been working at and giving them all kinds of practical training, uh, et cetera. This is the NGO. The, Sujit is actually one of our presidency college products. He's a Princeton uh, PhD in chemistry to win the lab. He started this NGO many years ago. And then he moved on to Azim Premji and he is retired now, uh, mostly, but he's still attached to it. But he's like a, he's somebody who has worked on these thousands of villages. You should get him sometime if you can, if he's still uh, available. Uh, then there is this uh, youth team, the uh, Kishore Kishori Bahini. So all of these things uh, are being done in experimental basis. We have also been working with uh, mentally uh, uh, mental health cases for uh, young women uh, in, in rural India. And because there are no uh, mental health facilities, I had suggested that we basically set up a place for the women to meet and hang out in small groups, uh, give them some nice food and make a nice and inviting environment, have them come and uh, talk to somebody who may be of some value. Um, so far, that's two years running. I found it myself, and uh, things are running pretty okay. In terms of many of these educational right. projects, uh, these are in various villages around North 24 Um Mostly off Parashat. 
on that side, on the eastern side of, of the uh, area. And these are numbers. I, I'm, I'm not going to bore you with all these details, but it, it is it is fascinating that one has to think outside the box and one has to worry about real things. For example, uh, if you are not able to keep the farmer community active, so if the children of farmers don't farm, what are we going to eat? We have a real problem. And this, this is a real problem because uh, the next generation is not going to be farming. Farming is, is so unprofitable and it's so middleman dominated that it has completely turned on its face. This, by the way, was the girl who was asking me all these questions. Now, just to give you a, a little last success story as I finish, sorry, I've, I've been talking for a while. Um, just around before COVID started, these friends of mine came and told me that, will you give us uh, some, some loan? We want to buy a van. So I said, why do, you, why do you need to buy a van? They said, well, it's because of the middlemen. We do a lot of, you know, we, we, we grow a lot of high quality produce, but we can't sell it in the, in the in Calcutta markets because who's going to get it over here in time? Uh, and, uh, you know, the middlemen essentially charge us so much money that the growers, they don't make any money, literally, that makes it worth their while. Same problem with every other farmer community, small farmer community. So they wanted to buy a van to be able to transport it. And I said, fine, no problem. I'll give you the money. You don't have to give, take it as a loan. But they said, no, we want it as a loan because we don't want to get used to getting money. So we'll take. So we cut a deal. So I gave them 25% as a gift and 75% as a loan. They pretty much paid me back. <clears throat> Instead of buying a van, they actually rented a van. So during COVID, it was very convenient because they wouldn't rent. And it turned out, long story short, that the, uh, that particular uh, effort is now running, uh, involving about two to 3,000 women farmers. Um, they do have a van that they use, and they are making such profit that that one business has now essentially triggered of the order of 10, 15 plus businesses and new businesses. For example, they, they're mushroom farmers. So most of the mushrooms you eat out there come from. Uh, and this is because the mushroom sellers wanted these people to do their work. So they actually have a fixed contract. So they give whatever they've been asked to do and just because they have such a good reputation. So this is the emergent effect. You start with a little seed, you put something in, and you see what looks up in the right direction because we have good instincts and it takes off. So similarly, we are also trying to do something in the education space where um, the idea is to make the kids curious. This particular one is like that, but it's actually in one of the juvenile prisons. This is for the boys. Um, there are many, many challenges that remain that they'll never go away. Um, for example, I, I gave you the example of the sanitary pad problem. Uh, this, the reason why the girls don't come to school is because the, getting rid of the sanitary pads is a problem. So the schools got this beautiful uh, spiel from some engineers from IIT and ISC who wanted to install um, you know, these uh, incinerators in the school where you can you know, they can put the pad in and then it just burn up and you can do it with a great deal of privacy excepting that the schools refuse to use them and the reason why the school refuse to use them is because is because this is dual heating so it's expensive and it's so expensive that it basically ate up their electricity budget so so there are thousands of these machines in rural indian schools that are just sitting there and the money has been taken. So this, is, this is typically the development experiment uh, that you see around. When you see a new story, you think, oh, something great happened. And then the answer is nothing happened. So uh, the suicide problem is exactly that because people have been blaming, you know, and not, like I said, when those numbers was what? It was, I think it was 17,000 last year. Just imagine, 17,000 normal young people dead for no reason. I wouldn't want it to be my choice, I don't think. 
So let me finish here. I, 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 and you can see that I have um, enormous amount of uh, stuff I can share with you. Uh, and, and this is Avi, who is a friend of mine, who is one of the leading authorities on designing uh, toilets for the disabled in the world, uh, confirming what I had found at USA for. And, and, and this causes an enormous expense because this results in kidney stone not being able to use the bathroom. Basically, they don't pee all day. So what do you expect? Um, I've already told you a bit of this. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there and let me finish. Um, there is a positive side to everything. And the positive side to everything is that uh, there are people like me. I am not the only one in the market who does these things. And it doesn't take much. Do you know how I do it? I do it in the following way. Seven, eight years ago, I became a stock market investor with the very little money I had. Because my doctor, who is an investor, my older doctor, he gave me a long lecture one day and said, what are you doing? I mean, you are a physicist, you should be able to invest. So I thought, yeah, maybe. I'm not sure what will happen. So I took $5,000 and I put it in one fund uh, for a while and I lost a lot of money. And then I joined it for... So he said, well, you do A, B, C, D, E, yeah. And then I, you know, we are learners, right? A, B, C, D, E work better. Then I realized I could do even better. And now I have realized that I can really do a lot better. Uh, so I can make a, I probably make just about more than my salary on the stock market. So, you know, if somebody needs any help, I'm happy to try and help that person. Um, because, you know, the fact is that I don't think any of us need much money really to live. It's a relatively fixed amount. So if you have that amount, and if you know that you know when you are older, you are covered. I mean, what can happen? If you if you're going to die on the gutter, you're going to die on the gutter. I mean, so. But I, some you have to buy eighty floor uh, apartments in Dubai. Of course. Yeah, if they have money, they use for that, right? I mean, hey, I, I have a BMW. I regret <laughs> buying it, but still. I mean, <laughs> It's the second NPM door. That's the only other. <laughs> that's the only consolation. I mean, I, I just I just decided that I was going to get myself a BMW just for fun. Then I realized if I have fun, I get tickets, more tickets. So I, I, I take it. So we have the, the paradigm is you have to be a curious and creative, independent thinker, and that you can you can have a much better world. But you have to have the guts to get out of the get out of the road. You have to have, and I think. We all have have it in us to change. Humans are incredibly creative, but it is very important to know the history. It's very important to know um, the people and the place, because most of the time we have this dirty word that has been made into a very holy word called scalable. Almost nothing in the world is scalable. Every place is unique. What is scalable to you in locally in Rajasthan will not be scalable to you in Gujarat will not be scalable to in some part of Madhya Pradesh or Maharashtra or Bengal. Scalability can be possible only in some technology type things. Internet can allow some scalability. But in a very detail. <coughs> Thank you. I'll, let me just stop here. I'm just talking for nothing. Okay, questions? <laughs>